Welcome to the wonderful world of wine, exploring all things wine with you. We are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, and you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello and welcome to this week's installment of The Wonderful World of Wine. We are your hosts, Kim and Mark, and every week we bring you trending topics from the wine world and hopefully interesting bits of wine information that you can use in your everyday life when you are either thinking about wine or looking for a new bottle to enjoy. And how are you this week, Mark? Everything's good, Kim. Good. I think that's true that we're finding interesting things. No one's really complained to us yet, right? <laughs> I think Some we questions find interesting more than, things. Yeah. We, uh, we dabble in so many different types of topics. You know, sometimes we talk about science and sometimes we talk about current events and the weather and the harvest and politics and all sorts of things that uh, impact the world of wine. And today we're going to start with a couple of articles that are more about the flavor of wine, flavor and texture. And I know we talk about those sensory aspects of wine a little bit from time to time. But as we move into summertime, it tends to be a little bit more of a white wine, rosé wine type of season. But there are whole categories of red wines that are appropriate for summertime drinking. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about what makes a flavor profile that is maybe a little bit more, I'd say, warm weather friendly and texturally something that we might call juicy or crushable or easy drinking. There's this whole category of red wines that I think make them really nice for summertime drinking. Yeah, the juicy one. I ended up with, I think I have a lot of questions for you on that, Kim, because the wine enthusiast article was, what does juicy mean? And we've done a lot of these, what does this mean and that mean? Mm -hmm. And juicy, I think, is one, we don't hear a lot of people saying juicy. And I know I've hit you with this a few times when I call wines grapey. Uh, and when we're talking about pairings, and I always have this peanut butter and jelly idea, and I say a wine, <laughs> right. to, uh, the wine to me that it's grapey, I feel, is juicy. And you brought up a few weeks back, I believe, because usually we associate juice with sweetness. And you mentioned something saying that the trend really in, in wine, I believe you said, that is going more juicy, I mean, sweet than fruit consistently. So I thought that kind of played into this article where it's more about that they're, they're saying it's not really a sweetness in wine. It's not really true that it's sweet when you're talking juicy. And I, I kind of want to get your feel on that. Well, I think that this using of the word juicy to describe sort of more fruit forward, easy drinking, and mostly red wines was what this uh, wine enthusiast article was talking about. I actually think that this is the new generation of terminology that might not be something that you would see on a talking point for a wine education class, but it might be along the lines of kind of what the newer generation of wine drinkers, winemakers, sommeliers in a more, I would say, casual environment are using as a descriptive term. And there are other ones that have come into the current lingo uh, recently. Uh, the, the one that stands out to me is glue glue, <laughs> which I'm like, what in the world is that? But it's used. And there are other terms that you know might you know might not, not might not find on a tasting sheet, but that are being used by younger folks uh, to describe wine and wine tasting and even wine categories. So I actually think that juicy is falling under that umbrella of more this next generation of wine tasting terms and wine descriptive terms. But for me, the idea of juicy goes beyond this fruitiness characteristic. And I feel like that juicy has to have a little bit of acidity to it too. That mouth watering play that goes on in your mouth that people might not be able to put their finger on and saying, oh, this has acidity to it, but it's just producing that really pleasant mouth watering characteristic that I think makes drinking a wine really pleasant. It doesn't feel too heavy in your mouth. It's bright and it kind of lightens up all of the other components to a wine. So I feel like that that's another really important characteristic in order to be able to call a wine juicy. Wine enthusiast was saying a juicy wine, it has to have the presence of fruit. So the right. aroma of fruit. So 
they also mentioned and, and correlated this with fruit forward wine, where we say yeah. a wine is fruit, so fruit forward. Right. So fruitiness first and foremost, but like imagine you have an apple that is kind of that mealy apple and you get a lot of that apple-y flavor, but it doesn't have that crunch, doesn't have that acid to it. I feel like that doesn't make me want to eat more of that apple. But if it has that apple fruitiness to it with some of that acidity, then that's what makes that a good yummy apple. <laughs> I want to finish the whole piece of fruit. And I'm glad you said apple because you mentioned they, they were really talking red wines, but that's a great example of apple and wine would yeah. be a juicy wine, totally. but it would be more acidic usually, mm -hmm. right? A white wine would have right. more acidity. And, and I don't, I don't feel juicy. like you that you can't use that juicy term with white wines. I feel like that that is also equally at home describing something that has a powerful apple or peach or tropical fruit note kind of wine. I don't feel like it should only be reserved for reds, but that whites can totally play yeah. that, on that playground as well. And I'm glad you touched on it because they really didn't go no, that didn't way in the article. And some examples they gave of a juicy red wine would be a Gamay wine, a Pinot Noir, a Merlot, and a Grenache. And to me, the point they put with these is really they're wines that most of those we drink young. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be juicier a wine when they're young. So and the they tend to be really on the lighter out. side too. Right. I had a Spanish and, and Grenache acidic. last week that it, that I could have mistaken for a Pinot Noir because it was light and bright and definitely was on that like less intense, lighter bodied end of the, the wine spectrum. When I used I used this term a few times for the Tempranillos I've had where I said they're grapey. Mm -hmm. It's a grapey wine. So when you're saying juicy, it could be grapey. It could be berry juicy, right? Like mm -hmm. blackberry juicy. It's just, it's just the profile. It could be apple juicy. I mean, there's so many ways we could use the term in, in the wine world. It, do you believe that juicy wines, you could also say a fruit bombs? It's all about just fruit? Um, I think you could. I often associate fruit bombs with that level of sweetness that we were talking about right at that very at the very beginning of this piece where you you know, right what is the trend is the trend of quote unquote juicy wines being sweeter wines or are we just talking about the flavor of the wine separated from the actual sugar content of it and I tend to associate quote unquote fruit bombs with something with a little bit of residual sugar to it so sometimes you get really over extracted, super ripe red wines from really hot climates like Southern Italy or, or Australia immediately comes to mind where they're so fruity and they're so jammy, juicy that they're out of balance because of that sugar and because of that fruit bomb characteristic, you know, yeah. what, how I would describe it. So I feel like you can have a juicy wine that is still a balanced wine and not necessarily a fruit bomb. I kind of find fruit bomb to be a little bit of a derogatory term when it comes to a wine, because it says to me, it's not in balance, but I, I, th that is just my own personal take on it. And I'm, you know, probably wrong in many ways that I'm sure there are many wines out there that people would describe as a fruit bomb that do have that balance to them. So send some my way, right. people. I want to try some. Just like when you said light, most of the wines they mentioned were light wines. When I see a real dark, inky colored wine right away, I think before I even smell, I think, oh, this is going to be fruity. This is going to yeah. be juicy because it just looks like it's juice. But know? it might not be. It right. might be it like be a, lot a of dark, or... savory, funky kind of wine that just yeah. by looking at the color, you're not going to know what those flavors are. So I think that's one of the fun things about going through the steps of tasting a wine. You know, you look at the color and then you smell the aromas and it's only that third step before you've actually put it in your mouth. So you really don't have any idea what that's going to taste like as far as the sweetness or the extraction or what those flavors are in there until you actually get it in your mouth. So without smelling a wine or tasting a wine, what are some things in wine that we know we can automatically say this wine is not going to be a juicy wine because of these things. And right away, I'm first thing I think of is oaked. Anything that is oak. But you're not going to know that much just by looking at the glass. No, you but I'm saying it. if you know that they're telling you the wine is oak, chances are it's oh, okay. not Oh, okay. So you do have be... some outside knowledge or inside right, knowledge. Right. So what were those things? I was thinking like mm. oaked 
or aged wine typically won't yeah. be juicy because that yeah. fruit is gone over time. It, and it I think when you look at things. the color too, if you have those wines that are purple tinge or, you know, have more of a red color going as opposed to a brownish or a brick-ish kind of color, that that should be a giveaway. That might be a slightly older wine that has maybe given up some of its uh, primary fruit character. What about food pairing for a juicy wine? I tend to go for like more easygoing kind of food. You know, I, I don't necessarily put, I hate to say serious food, but <laughs> serious food <laughs> yeah. with kind of these lighter and dare I say more fun styles of wines. You know, this is the kind of red wine, if we're just talking about the red wines that I want to have with a slice of pizza, that I want to have with a burger, that I want to have with maybe something with more of a a sweeter, fruitier kind of a note to it, like barbecue or something along those lines. So I think a lot of it comes down to, well, what's the weight of the wine? What's the texture of the wine? What are the flavors in the wine? And then pair accordingly. Yeah. What's the, the fruit coming forward in that juicy wine? Is it like you mentioned earlier, jammy wines versus mm -hmm. berry wines? And I, I, I would just play on the the fruit what do you want to enhance on that juiciness what do you want to bring out and yeah i mean there are would, a lot of foods and then it would also take the alcohol content into consideration because if it's too high in alcohol and you try to pair it with something that's maybe a little spicy i feel like there will be some conflict there between the flavor of the wine as far as that alcohol goes and then the the spice in the food sometimes higher alcohol will make spicy food burn. Yeah, that's a good point because like the classic example of that high alcohol would be like a juicy Zinfandel that's really high alcohol, mm -hmm. but still has good fruit. You just got to be careful that the alcohol won't overpower the, mm -hmm, the exactly. food. So yeah, good example. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. You can find our past episodes on SoundCloud or iTunes. You can find us on Instagram at The Wonderful World of Wine. We post a lot of content also on our Twitter page at Wine Education. For more information about Kim, please go to her website, at commonwealthwineschool.com. And for my website, it's franklinlickers.com. Next, we want to keep following up with our fruit and crushable red wines. Now, Kim, there was an article in pickswine.com. What makes red wine crushable? And this term, have you ever used this, a crushable wine? I have not, but this goes back to my initial comment about wine terms being introduced by the younger generation who... Uh, in all their rights are taking over the helm a little bit from some of us older older people who have been around for a while and uh, and developing new terminology that makes sense to them and that resonates with a new market of wine drinkers, new demographics of wine drinkers. And this word crushable is uh, definitely something that I've been seeing more and more out there. I don't personally use it, but it's there. It's out there. Yeah, I'm glad they started by saying, where did this come from, this term come from in the first place? And they related it to like frat keg parties or beer, <laughs> the beer. Like, and now I do recall a lot of times hearing that about it's a crushable beer. It's a light, it's just an easy drinking beer. But now we're bringing it into the wine world. So we, we have to talk about it. And I, I was kind of thinking maybe this is a, you know, it's a it's an age thing or young people might want to use it, but is it a good thing for wine to to jump onto this as far as a marketing or health conscious thing. Do we want to say buy a bottle of our wine because it's crushable? Do you want to tell people to crush a bottle of wine? You know, so you don't want so what you're saying is you don't want to encourage people to drink too much or too fast or not pay attention to the flavors in their glass yeah, is how I'm, I mean, how I'm interpreting. Yeah, and, but you have to be, I mean, there's certain wine types that you could put in this and that's what we're going to talk about. And the key I would think is it has to be low alcohol, right? Because you don't want to get to that 16% Zinfandel and crush it and just drink the yeah, whole that's thing not, without being but, but a wine like that, I don't think would fall into the category of this being a crushable wine. So right, I think we we're hope safe not. there. And they were stating, this is just about a wine that you can just, you don't want to put down. And that could mean 
for any reason, right? It could be because of the acidity, the juiciness, whatever. I was kind of thinking it's more of a chillable thing, especially this time of year, crushable. Mm -hmm. They call them what uh, porch pounders was the term that was out there for a while. (laughs) Yeah. Something you could just sit on the porch and drink it. And next thing you know, you've basically drank more (laughs) of it than you thought you did, right? So that it would be a crushable wine. So what uh, to you, Kim, what category or what uh, varietal would you say? Is it seasonal crushable wines? Is How would you? I, th- I think that there is some seasonality, not 100% because some of us drink rosé in the middle of the wintertime. But given their examples, um, we are definitely leaning towards the lighter bodied side of things, especially when it comes to reds. So a lot of the reds that were highlighted in this article are very similar to the ones that we just talked about in the first half of this episode, where we're talking about Grenache or Pinot Noir or Gamay, you know, things that have a distinctly fruity characteristic to them. They also bring some red blends into the conversation here, which I think is also something that could be an important way of looking at the category because we tend to find, especially for American wine producers, that you do get that easier drinking red style from the overall category of red blends. Sometimes they are um, a little simpler in style, but again, made to go with burgers and barbecue and pizza and easy drinking wine with easy drinking food. But then there are other wines, like they mention in this article, that really are what we would consider fine wines. Some of the better Lambruscos from central Italy were brought up in this article. Some really wonderful things from Sicily that are probably not on people's radars uh, fall into this category of just an easy to drink, but really good quality, balanced, beautiful wine. So I was very impressed that it wasn't just inexpensive Pinot Noir or Beaujolais in kind of the lower tier, you know, where there were some other interesting and dare I say, exciting complex wines on this list that also can fall into that crushable category. So, you know, it made me think like, Ooh, summer's coming. I gotta go yeah. get myself a few, a few of these bottles, especially those Sicilian things. Cause I really do love wines from Sicily. That's the great thing about the wine world, right? There's so much out there. That oh, and it gets you so excited. It really gets me so excited. <laughs> so I wrote down four Category. Well, I wouldn't, I don't know if they're categories, but four things I want to ask you. And I, you, I want you to kind of rank them one to four, what you feel makes a wine more crushable. Mm. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. The first one would be the ability to chill it. The second one would be light alcohol. The third one would be fruity. Let's say fruit bomb. And the fourth one would be you don't need food. So ah. the most crushable, would it be chill, light alcohol, good fruit, fruit bomb, or doesn't need food? Like rank them one to four, what do you think? So my number one would be that lower alcohol level. I think it's really hard to consistently put back something that is kind of (laughs) boozy. Like For me, that doesn't equate with a crushable wine. And then for the next parameter, I'm kind of tied between the fruity character and that you don't necessarily need food with them. Um, One of the things that I liked about this list that they recommend at the end of the article is that so many of them can be good food wines, but that they don't necessarily need to have food with them. But that being said, you know, a lot of these still have a lot of that old world characteristic of the fruit might not necessarily be the dominant characteristic of the flavor profile. Like I don't really consider too many of these to be overt fruit bombs. The fruit is there, but it's balanced with some other interesting kind of more savory notes. So those two have their pros and their cons for me to put them in the second place. And then I would probably put the chillable thing kind of at the bottom because I don't necessarily feel like it has to be something that's cold. Um, Maybe when you're drinking it during warmer weather, it is easier to consume a lot of something if it has a slight chill on it. But this is not a wine, a wine category that I feel like necessarily has to have a season. So if you are doing the crushable wines of, say, November, (laughs) you know, you can have some of these red wines that don't necessarily have to have a chill on them but that you can still enjoy to the extreme um, something that's not necessarily cold. 
that yeah, makes sense? I agree with that. My first was alcohol. My last was chill. So we're pretty much on the same page with that. Are we reversed when it comes to the middle ones? Did you have a, a clear, no, I mean, a clear I, second? I think you had a good point. I, I kind of would fruit third. I mean, they, food they, second. They all, like, fruit all third. of those categories have their merits yeah. about why they might be more or less important as a defining characteristic of this category. I was, you know, was kind of stuck with those middle two. It's like, oh, I really could go either yeah. way. <laughs> We're pretty close. Yeah. So tell me your, especially right now, what would be your red crushable, white crushable? Ooh. So I think for red, I would either have to go with, like I said, one of those lighter reds from Sicily. And they do mention a particular frappato in this uh, article from Planeta, who is a producer that I really, really like. But they also make another red wine called Cherisuolo di Vittoria, which is a blend of frappato and Nero d'Avola which I find, you know, is something that really kind of fits into this category. So I would either go with that or I would go with Beaujolais. So I really feel like Beaujolais would, it kind of hits all of those notes. It's not necessarily always higher in alcohol. It's got some interest to it. It's got beautiful fruit. You can put a little bit of a chill on it. And I feel like it's just a wine that you can drink all year long. What about for a white? Mm, For a white. (sighs) I'm going to stick with a tried and true New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc for me is always crushable. I was I was shocked. I thought you'd say bubbly of some sort. Oh, well, that too. I mean, that's that's always a given. But I feel like for something white that has a nice fruit to it, sometimes some tropical notes, bright acidity, just easy drinking that you look over and you're like, is there any more in the bottle? And the answer is no. <laughs> like if yeah, yeah. if you want another pour and the bottle is already gone because the two of you have already finished it, then that I feel like is a really good indication that that is a crushable wine. The Sicilian grapes you mentioned it's the wines is interesting to me because i always find it funny it's so hot there but they can enjoy i mean frappato is on the light side but neuro to me always comes off as a more medium full body Yeah, there are some but then you know you can find other ones that are that are very much more easy to drink you know they're they're not necessarily all going to taste like the uh the soils of mount etna (laughs) some of them have this really beautiful fruit fruit component to them yeah. And I like that you went Italian because both of mine, red and white, are Italian. Yeah. What are and yours? I, I've been crushing a ton of Brichetto Aki. Oh, Brichetto is so good. Piemonte. I, You know, I was going to go the slightly sweet route. Like that was, I was almost yeah. there for white. I was like, maybe off dry Riesling could totally be my style. And I'm glad that you went there. See, you went with sweet and bubbly. Both of my sweet. Oh, you, you, you took is them from me. <laughs> my sweet light red, and I chill it. I do chill it. I enjoy yeah. it chilled, and I oh, like so you- Moscato di Asti. We they're both you know five six percent alcohol. They're both sweet, not super sweet, but they do have sweetness to mm-hmm. them. And you can honestly, sad to say, you can drink them like soda. You can. You don't even. It's at that alcohol level where. It doesn't uh, kick in for a long time uh, and uh, you can really just enjoy them. I mean, there are a lot of beers that have higher alcohol than that. So, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, those are my go to right now for crushable. Now, the other thing I had to ask you, Kim, is would you relate crushable wine to a price point? Do you think anyone sitting down with a twenty, fifty, hundred dollar wine and calling it a crushable wine. I, I would hope that people were not crushing a hundred dollar bottle of wine. You know, please sit <laughs> yeah. and savor that. So but, you, but I think that there could be some thing, that are right? that are a little that you know could work in a higher price point, but I don't necessarily feel like they have to. Like my Brachetto is honestly a fifteen, seventeen dollar yeah. range. Some are sure. twenty for a sparkling. So yeah. It's so I mean not that's like not a $10. inexpensive. Right. Right. So I, but it is it should be to to us, right? It should be a relatively inexpensive bottle you just enjoy. Well, I mean, and if you get down to some of these Cru Beaujolais, which can be on the lighter side, have really pretty fruit, those tend to start kind of at twenty, mid twenties. So we're not talking in necessarily inexpensive bottles there either. Anything else on crushable and juicy at all? Just think that it's sort of fun that we're introducing our listeners to these uh, new terms that they may not have run across before, but that are out there. And especially if you are reading wine blogs or or listening to other podcasts besides ours, which is okay, uh, you may run across these terms. And so this is what they mean. (laughs) 
Thank you for listening to us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. We have been your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine, and we would love to hear your questions and comments posted there. Find us on Twitter at Wine Education, and we hope to hear from you soon. Cheers. Cheers.